everybody. Welcome back to Cocktails and Rocktails with Notorious Groupie Allison Rouse. That would be me and author of We've Got Tonight, The Life and Times of Notorious, well, you know. Groupie Allison Rouse, that would be me. Anyway, welcome back, you guys. Thank you for all the love, all the support, all the awesome ideas, friendships, everything that I am gaining from this channel is so amazing. For all the love and support and for all the new people that are stumbling on, welcome aboard. Love to have you guys. And also just to let the new people know where you can get my book, The Cocktail of the Day, uh, my merchandise, everything, it's down in the description. So go down like it's the 80s, folks, and see what's happening in the description. There's lots of cool stuff. And speaking of cool stuff, we're going to get back today to a topic I haven't done in a while, and I'm so excited to start it up again. We're going back to the groupie series where I talk about different groupies or compare different groupies. And today there is no comparison to this groupie we're going to talk about. And just to give you a hint, the cocktail of the day is going to be the Dirty Hooker. It's a nice little shot with some banana liqueur. And because we call it the Dirty Hooker, we're talking about Nancy Spungen. That's right. She is a punk icon and I there's no doubt about that because she is definitely a huge part of punk history, let's face it. She was immersed, not just with the Sex Pistols. All right, so let's get going and talking about Nancy. So everybody grab your dirty hookers, kick up your feet, and let's have a little cocktails and rocktails, shall we? All right, cheers, big ears. All right, not bad, oh, hold on. Not bad, not bad. I'm not a big fan of banana liqueur, but this is done really white, right with the raspberry, I dig it. All right, guys. So let's get talking about Nancy Spungen. Let me pull a couple things up here real quick. Sorry. Um, so she was pretty young when she was diagnosed, not with just schizophrenia, but she left home at 17 and kind of went up to New York City. Well, it, I, I'm not sure in, uh, I believe she's from Philadelphia. I'm not sure because I, I don't know who she met up with in Philadelphia that spurred her on to go to New York City. I'm, I'm guessing it was around the New York Dolls because she was sleeping with Johnny Thunder and, um, oh, what's the lead singer's name? Um, God, he has a couple different names. Why can't I think about that? And Sil Sylvain. So I, I'm kind of guessing that, but anyway, I, I, she went, sorry, I had to pause for a second there because I sneezed. Anyway, so she went up to New York relatively young in her teens. She was kind of like me at that age of a groupie. I mean, I wasn't schizophrenic and nor did I make decisions in my life to make money crossing a certain line, you know. But so I kind of get that in a way. And she was like good friends with Sable Star and um, Debbie Harry, Chrissy Hyde and her kind of got along in a way because Chrissy seemed to be nice to everyone. But so she went up to New York City and she really like immersed herself, just went out and got what she wanted, you know, and as nightmare as she could have been, I've heard things from different people and Sable Star even said this, that she was really sweet, like a broken child. But once things kind of got into her head or the schizophrenia emerged, the alcohol, the drugs, whatever, she started becoming kind of more nasty. And she was always kind of loud and abrasive. And I think that kind of fearlessness and that in being loud and abrasive worked for her and really, really like kind of got her into the scene where she was. So as much as I kind of think she was crazy and she wasn't bad looking, you know, she definitely had a body that was hot. She wasn't bad looking. I could see where they would see the innocence of a child, but the abrasiveness of the schizophrenia, I think was kind of how she lived on the edge like that. And, you know, with her living on the edge and that being her illness, the schizophrenia and stuff, I really, really do think that, um, I think that's kind of what kept her from really having longer relationships with the musicians because they would see that coming and they didn't want to go over the edge with her in that manner. You know, some of them were already going on the edge on their own direction, but 
to go down with that extra baggage of Nancy, I think, was, like, more terrifying than the drugs itself. That's just my opinion, because, you know, by the time she went to, what was she, 18 when she went to the UK, and, let's see here, sorry, I'm going to go to a page here, let's do, 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 do. Sorry, guys, I'm looking on my um, tablet while I'm talking to you guys as well. So, I mean, because she died when she was only 20 years old. So she couldn't have been in New York long before she went to London. And... What's kind of crazy like that, it's like, okay, yeah, we know she was a prostitute. She was crazy. She was probably selling drugs, doing whatever she had to do to live. And she was actually pretty small. She was only like 5'1", five, 5'2". Five, so she was like this crazy, you know, little firecracker thing. And so I can see the attraction because, like I said, she's not bad looking and I could see her being saucy and funny and kind of sweet and people being drawn in by that. And how she went to the UK, I'm not sure. I think it might have been with like Jerry Nolan or the dolls and she just stayed over there. You know, she slept with Dee Dee Ramone too, which kind of like, oh my God, those are two crazy drug out of people that are just so volatile to drop of a hat I cannot imagine how that went down or ended up the next morning that must have been crazy but so as we know she all ends up in London with Sid Vicious everything that happens you know but she didn't just sleep with Sid Vicious she was also sleeping with Steve Jones and I think she slept with Johnny Rotten maybe not I think I, I'm, I'm kind of blurry on whether he shunned her or whether he shunned her after sleeping with her. But yeah, Steve definitely says, oh, I fucked her. Yeah, we all know that. So, you know, she was kind of making the rounds. And I think for her, being a groupie was something not just about, like, like I always say, it's about being with my tribe and being at the eye of the storm with the music and I think she felt welcomed by music and a little safe to be so schizophrenic because, you know, rock and roll is very accepting and punk, there was a little bit of schizophrenia, it's definitely happening there in a lot of different directions in punk music, but, so I think she felt kind of safe, but for her I think it was more of, she was trying so hard to be loved and find someone that loved her, that could take care of her, or she could take care of, and you know, have that little family idea in her head which you know and Sid in I think was also looking for someone who was more of a mother than his actual mother was you know she was kind of a hippie drug addict kind of you know bringing a lot of men home woman and so when they met in London I think it just kind of like two magnets just sort of shook. well magnets usually repel each other but they were just drawn together like matches and fire you know I mean they just went together and when it just sparked and it created a domino effect you know she kind of gave because of how her story went and how big her story was she kind of gave groupies a bad name this is I where I believe that groupies kind of got that degrading label so to speak that oh you don't know your daddies your families are shunned you're nothing but a needy whore all this stuff because she kind of was let's face it I think that for her being a groupie she was looking to be part of a bigger family that she wasn't at home you know so I think for her when she met Sid that was definitely she thought she had finally found that, but it, I think it ended up really actually being more frustrating for her because she had to babysit, sit, babysit Sid most of the time. And she, I, again, kind of unclear on whether Sid was still a virgin when he met her, supposedly so, or might have only been with one other person. He was only with three women in his life, you know, so whether Nancy was the first or not. And I think Nancy kind of, she was kind of drawn to that because if she was his first, then she would be the woman that would always be comparable or maybe she could draw him in more, draw him down. 
and with the drugs and stuff. Because like I said, whether he did drugs before he met Nancy, I'm not sure. But what I do know for sure is wherever Nancy went, she kind of left a little bit of a aftermath like a tornado does, you know? Because like I said, I mean, Debbie Harry and Sable obviously liked her. They were all really young at the time. So that I think they kind of got each other and found a camaraderie in that. But everybody seemed to pull away from her and the people who surrounded her sooner or later because she was so abrasive and the schizophrenia just and the alcohol and drugs just turned ugly most of the time. But I think Sid kind of found that he needed that kind of mothering and taking care of and direction and, and control in his life, I guess. Does that make sense? I mean, so when they got together, I think, you know, and she said, she said in motion, the domino effect that would be led up to her murder when they went to New York and stuff. And, you know, I honestly don't think Sid v Vicious killed her. I think it was, there's a whole story about a drug dealer and the money with the hair tie and stuff. And I think that's more true along the lines that he came in because he had a beef with Nancy and owed her money or something. And I think Nancy kind of fought back in the way she would. And in some ways that's good that she had that strength in her to stand up for herself. But at the same time, because of the drugs, alcohol, and mental illness, it could also be a very huge deterrent. And in this case, I think it ended up being that deterrent. And like I said, she left an aftermath no matter what. When she got with Sid and he was pulled out of the Sex Pistols and, you know, the drugs that he got into as much as he did after meeting her and the prostitution and the infidelities and stuff that she was doing. And then, like I said, with, even with, in her death, the man she loved, that truly loved her, that put her on the pedestal and would do anything including kill take his own life for her because that's pretty much what he did but you know she left him in that aftermath this one person that really loved her that needed her that looked at her for guidance and direction like you would a mother and I think that was really the dynamic of that relationship because Sid was one of the few guys she was with that didn't have that physical mental and emotional experience with women and sex, drugs, and rock and roll, so to speak. Sid was not very um, experienced in any of those directions. So, you know, like I said, I think with, with Nancy, it's definitely where the epitome idea of a groupie came from. The we don't know our dads, we all have drug problems, we're all needy, looking for something that we were missing in our childhoods, which is absolutely false for 99% of the groupies that I know, and even ones I don't like. I don't think Scammy DeBars had a, a messed up upbringing. I think she was your normal average class, same with Baby Buell, or, you know, just your normal upbringing. And so she kind of, for me, was... In one way, well done her, she had the strength and the gumption to go up as a teenager and lived more in the three years that she had left after she left home than most people will live in their lifetimes. And she left a mark on punk rock history that nobody wants to leave and nobody really can surpass. But she also, like I was saying, gave Groupie a bad name in a way, which kind of bothers me. So I'm kind of on the fence with her 50-50. I think that, like I said, with anybody she loved, she left a pretty hideous aftermath. Because I don't think Sid killed her. I think it was something more to do with one of the drug dealers that stopped by and whatever, you know. I, I And I think that just affected Sid, and I think that was pretty horrible. But And mostly that was the drugs and schizophrenia talking, you know. Because, like I said, she wasn't a bad person. She wasn't... She was... I think she was actually pretty in her own way. And her hair and stuff. And she always did her own thing. So I can respect that about her. But I can't respect what she... The legacy she left behind on the name of groupies. Does that make sense? So I'm kind of on the... I Like I say, I'm kind of on the fence with her as to whether she's a good or bad girl. I think she could go either way depending on what 
the voices in her head were telling her to do. And she had to scream and yell and because that was the only way she got attention or knew how to get attention or to be heard. So I think she, her abrasiveness just overrode really what was kind of a sweet little soul inside of her. And I hope she's resting in peace and happy and her soul is up in rock and roll heaven having a good time with all the guys she knew. I really do. Because like I said, she's definitely a punk icon. There's no denying that. She put a mark in rock and roll history and a lot of people, you know, she's legendary. She's a legendary among the groupies, you know, but for all the wrong reasons, I think, unfortunately. So there you guys go. There's my thoughts on Nancy Spungen, punk rock icon groupie and crazy ass bitch. Let's face it. <laughs> but that's kind of my take on her and her relationship with Sid and what they needed from each other and. But, you know, she, like I said, she left home so early. She, I, I have no doubt that she did hook up with bands in Philadelphia, and that's why she took up to New York. And she just went out brazen and lived her life and did whatever it took to keep it going. And good on her for having that strength and that insanity and that being able to sink to certain depths. I mean, can't hate her, but feel sorry for her and love her at the same time. All right, guys. Thank you again for all the love and support. Like I said, don't forget to go down in the, 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 the description. And while you're on your way down there, hit that subscribe button. Hit the share. And hit my bells. You know I'm grabbing my boobies. <laughs> Alright guys, we'll see you next time for some more cocktails and rocktails with me, Notorious Groupie, Allison Rouse. Cheers, big ears. <laughs>